Hello and welcome to Zero Pucks Given, the UK ice hockey podcast. I'm Ben and we are in partnership with Blades Belong on Your Feet, the charity fighting knife crime with ice skating all across the UK. And we are in partnership with the Hockey Art Co, hockey clothing for hockey people, worn by the best and hated by the rest. Listeners to Zero Pucks Given get a 10% discount on everything site-wide at hockeyartco.co.uk. Just enter the code ZP10 upon checkout to get your discount. And if you like the Hockey Art Co jerseys that they do, they've made the Foo Fighters, Taylor Hawkins Memorial jersey, the Blink-182 jersey, the Metallica jersey. There is jersey giveaways happening this week. So head over to Hockey Art Co on Instagram to see how you can win one of those. Now then, this is episode 56. We've got a roundup of the Britain Division action from this weekend. And we're also catching up with former ice hockey player and now business performance coach, Will Polston. Uh, but first, let's round up those Britain results. There wasn't a great deal of other news regarding stuff in the league. Obviously, we had everything that happened last week that was covered in the last episodes with regards to the EIH. Hey, uh, Barry Archer has resigned from his post there. So we'll be looking at how the EIHA are going to go around sorting themselves out. It's been a lot of call for them to merge with Ice Hockey UK and get a, a lot better control over our game in this country. Hopefully, we'll be discussing that in more detail in a couple of weeks with Jamie McElroy. We'll be uh, having a good old dig at the whole hockey world and seeing how it can be improved in Britain. But for now, let's get to this weekend's roundups and we'll start at the high road as the Streatham Redhawks hosted the Chelmsford Chieftains. Saturday night at the high road then, Streatham hosted the Chieftains and it was quite a large crowd eventually. Both sides missing players, the visitors missing five from their top two lines, and it showed across the game. The Chieftains were the stronger side in the first 10 minutes, forcing a couple of good saves from Milton, but a close-range goal from Briggs on 12-26 and a power play goal from Brittle on 14-29 gave the hosts a 2-0 lead in the first. Streatham bossed the second and doubled their advantage with two goals from Waller, both on the power play, the first a fantastic snipe in the top corner from the circle. The third started with a bang as Ben Painter and Grant Bartlett dropped gloves, but it had little effect on the result as Briggs and Beasley finished off the tie with two further power play goals on 45 flat and 58-01. A shutout for Milton, the home side absolutely ruthless on the power play with Man of the Match, Man of the Match awards for Waller and Ray. Solent Devils versus MK Thunder then. The Devils hit the ice running and raced into a four-goal lead in the first period with goals from Hutchinson, Sutton, Callum Perella fox and Alex Murray playing his 350th Devils game. The second period saw Osman grab a shorthanded goal to make it 5-0. For side scored to make it 6, Alex Murray added the 7th to make it 2 for him on the night. Into the third and Osman made it 8-0 with another shorthanded goal. For side scored again to make it 9-0. Campbell made it 10, Peacock made it 11, and Dan Lackey finally made it 12 for the rampant Devils who will head to Oxford on Sunday in search of a four-point weekend. Slough versus Invicta then. Invicta headed to the hangar with only 14 skaters and two netminders, but took the lead on 10.58 through Springer Hughes before Jack Goodchild scored short-handed on 13.49 to level up. The second period saw the Jets take the lead through Ollie Hemmings Mayer on the power play on 26 37. However, Invicta pulled it back to 2 2 just over a minute later through Huggett. Invicta took the lead even handed on 38 58 with a goal from Dan Scott and extended the lead before the end of the second when Huggett scored again on 36 48. Into the third, and Bradburn pulled a goal back for Slough on 44 40. And after a melee of penalties, including Stevenson getting a five plus game for fighting that left Slough on a five minute power play, they took advantage with goals from Goodchild on 53 30, Seb Moore on 55 52 to swing the game in their favour. Victor called a timeout with a minute to go and pulled Owen Ryder in the final 60 before Jack Goodchild settled it with an empty net goal for his hat trick on 59 30. An incredible game at the hangar after those four unanswered goals in the third period. Man of the match for Jack Goodchild for the Slough Jets and Invicta will have to host the Hungry Stress and Red Hawks on Sunday night. Invicta versus Red Hawks is Sunday night's game in Gillingham. Both teams with only 17 available and a tight start to the game until Jordan Gregory gave Stressham the lead on 4.26. Invicta had a goal washed out on the power play for a player being in the goalkeeper's crease and the end of the first saw the Moes trailing by one goal to nil. Right at the start of the second period, Springer Hughes made it 1-1 on 21-21, 21, 
assisted by Saw and Lillis. That's Lillis's 100th point for the Dynamos there. Five minutes later, on 26-25, Streatham retook the lead through Luke Brittle, and the second ended 2-1. And despite a few penalties in the third and Inglesby heading off injured for the Red Hawks, as well as some more empty net play from Invicta, they couldn't get back in the game to force overtime, and the Red Hawks have themselves a four-point weekend. And Victor Dynamos, however, draw a second blank in a row. After the game, Dynamos head coach Carl Lennon gave his thoughts. We went into this weekend uh, off the back of two poor performances the week prior. And, of course, we're playing against two very difficult teams in Slough and Streatham, knowing that they would pro- provide us with a big challenge. And um, added to that, we had, I think, nine players not available uh, across the weekend due to various reasons, injuries, illnesses and so on. So even I had to take some shifts on, on Saturday myself, uh, which is not ideal. But I still felt as a team we could be competitive uh, in both of those fixtures and the boys were exactly that. They played hard and fast all weekend and I couldn't have asked for anything more uh, for any of them really. Um, aside from you know a couple moments of poor judgement on our part and maybe a few refereeing decisions, I thought quite honestly that we could have come out of both of the games with something and I think a reflection of that is that you know of course we pulled our goalie in the final minute of both fixtures and and only just t- t- took the loss so of course we're disappointed not to get any points and on a different day maybe that would have been the case but that's the way it is sometimes in sport we played two very good teams and uh you know, ultimately they did just that little bit more than we did to get the result that they needed. So there are lots of positives to take from the performances and I think the the application and the the intention of the players across the weekend was fantastic and I you know, I couldn't fault one of them quite honestly. So we we live and we learn, we get better every every time and uh, ultimately now we have to, to put that into practice. We'll have a, another solid week of of that ahead of uh, a game against Milton Keynes at home on Saturday and uh, looking forward to to getting back on track. We need to pick up the, the points that we haven't in, in weeks previous to now. So uh, there's an added incentive, of course, um, when it comes to that. So looking forward to the week, looking forward to the game and um, thanks. Sunday night, Oxford versus Solent. A night of celebrations for both teams as the Oxford Stars welcome back their most capped player, Darren Elliott, to the roster. And the Solent Devils congratulate Captain Alex Cole on his 400th appearance for the South Coast team. And after a few penalties in the opening period, neither team could force a power play goal. However, on 16-12, Peacock put the Solent Devils in the lead even-handed. The Stars had a power play chance towards the end of the first but couldn't take advantage. Russell nearly doubled their lead at the start of the second on the odd man after intercepting a pass across the neutral zone, but couldn't beat Miller. The Stars did equalise on 33-44 even-handed, a goal by Matt Lauder assisted by Taylor and Elliott. The third started 1-1 and the Devils came out on the front foot and retook the lead with a goal from Ryan Sutton on 43-37 with a delayed penalty goal. Four minutes later, the Oxford crowd got exactly what they wanted when Darren Elliott equalised to make it 2-2 on 47-33. Remainder of the third period was tight and after Stevenson took a two-minute penalty for Oxford on 59-38, the Stars would start overtime on the penalty kill. After turning to full strength, well, even strength for overtime, Oxford dinged the iron before Murray assisted Ryan Sutton to seal the win in overtime, 63-19. Another entertaining game between these two, resulting in extra minutes. The first double weekend for the Devils, and it's a four-pointer. After the game, Devils player coach Alex Murray gave his thoughts to ZPG. Yeah, obviously, a uh, really impressive our weekend. Uh, first double header of the uh, season for us against Milton Keynes and uh, Oxford. And Saturday was a, a respectful, you know, routine win there, twelve 0 at home. And it's great to get all the guys going. Great to get Ben Mills a debut and uh, Rory some time in goal and Riley Panahan regular shifts and all the guys played really well. I think we were just talked about, you know, letting bad habits creep in and making sure that we weren't going to allow for that. And the guys did really well, staying professional. And, you know, it was good to pick up the points there in that win. And then um, Sunday, Oxford, we knew it was going to be a different game because, you know, they'd, they'd made some signings and it was going to be a tougher game. And, Realistically, I felt we played well in the game, but, you know, needed overtime to take that win. And so 
ultimately, you know, we were impressed with the four-point weekend and really happy with those results. And it keeps us in, in contact with the guys at the top. And we go ahead and next weekend, a really big game against Slough Way, hoping that we can continue on our journey. And after the game, Carl Catling asked the questions of Simon Anderson. Evening everyone, it's finished here, Oxpens Road on Sunday night in Oxford. The Oxford City Stars 2, Sonic Devils 3, um, a fortunate overtime loss. Coach Simon Anderson, so close, right? Yeah, I thought we were excellent tonight. You know, it's, uh, we made a few changes in the week. I thought last week was unacceptable after this level. And, um, you know, we needed to shake things up. We've lost. Awesome. I don't know what it is now, nine, nine games this time last week. And we just thought we needed to bring a couple of fresh faces in and freshen things up. And I think right off the bat, you know, it's, it's done, the, done the trick. We had a lot more energy in warm-up. And, you know, tonight it's the way lucky, you know, where the puck goes half inch the other side of the post. It's posting in and we get away with two points tonight. But, um, you know, we got a point, you know, it was a great performance. And, you know, I was really proud of the boys' efforts tonight. Thunder versus Buccaneers. The Thunder would be looking to repeat their home victory over the Buccaneers from September and, of course, look to keep it tighter than the 12-0 mauling they suffered in Saturday night in Gosport. It didn't go quite that way, though, after Hill gave Romford the lead early on. It was doubled by Caps and added to by Luca Pascali. Ewan Hill made it 4-0 before the end of the first. Into the second and Courtney Grant made it 5 for the Buccaneers before Pascali added his second to make it 6. MK Thunder then pulled one back through Cox with his first senior goal before Kobe Grinnell Park made it 7-1 for the Buccaneers. Shea Woolman got himself on the score sheet to make it 8-1 before Brindley Caps added his second to make it 9. The scoring was finished by Ewan Hill netting his hat-trick 10-1 at the Thunderdome, a great win for the Buccaneers, the Thunder back to the drawing board. Since the, the defeat, the Thunder have released the following statement. After two big losses this weekend, we sat and had a lengthy team meeting. We have capable players and a locker room full of great guys. We are stuck in a rut, and this week we will be, we will be all about getting ourselves out of it. There were some positives to take from yesterday. The photo we've posted was number 67, James Cox's first Thunder goal. He woke the team up after that. MK Storm Junior Ice Hockey Club 16-year-old goalie played the last eight minutes, making his senior debut and saving 10 out of 11 shots. Huge thanks to their fans who never lose faith. Thank you also to those who stepped up and filled match night roles for us. We couldn't do it without you. As we know, hockey clubs do not function without those volunteers. After those weekend fixtures then, it's now time for this. Hi, it's Justin Wong, Kenny Wu from the Muddy Ducks, presenting Zero Pucks Given Britain Division Player of the Week. ZPG Britain Division Player of the Week. Again, as every week, a few great performances. Seems to be the same few knocking up points with hat-tricks for Jack Goodchild and Ewan Hill. Goals and apples galore for Brindley Caps. But this week, it was a player stopping points. A shutout on Saturday and a man of the match on Sunday in a four-point weekend where he conceded just once. This week's Player of the Week is Streatham Red Hawks goalie Danny Milton. <laughs> Now all that's dealt with, we can get to our guest, former Chelmsford ice hockey player, recently played in the Joshua Batch testimonial, now business performance coach, airplane pilot, amongst many other things, I'm sure. Will Polston. Zero Pucks Given in partnership with Blades Belong on Your Feet and the Hockey Art Co. Presenting Will Polston. How are you doing this evening, fella? I'm very good, thank you. Very good indeed. Thank you so much for joining me. It's, uh, it's been a long time coming. We were supposed to meet in October, I suppose, but my, my dog ended up in the vet, so we had to cancel. No but, um, worries at all. How's the dog now? You know what? She's she's fine. She she had such a severe injury about a year ago that cost us so much money to fix, even though she's insured. And now she jumps around like there's nothing wrong with her. I'd like a cursory limp every now and again just to know it was yeah, worth the money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I mean, you giving up your time for me to do this is incredible for me because following you on the, on social media, came across you because you were obviously a Chieftains player for, for a long time. Your whole hockey career was at Chumpsford. 
But where do you find time in the day? You must have more than 24 hours in the day. Yeah, I, uh, I I like to squeeze the most out of uh, of, of the day. I managed to get get a few bits done. So uh, yes, uh, yeah. got, got, so, got to make the most of it. We have, yeah, and get it once, of course. So starting yeah. with hockey, you were you were champs for your for your entire career. Yeah, um, right, right from youth through to to chieftains. You must have played with some players coming through at the time that you did. Yeah, I, I suppose. Um, I mean, I I grew up at champs, and I. For me, ice hockey started, believe it or not, ice hockey actually started for me at Romford. Um, and why I say started for me at Romford was because I, my, my family are all from Romford and, and we went ice skating on like a Saturday afternoon one day. And um, and, and then I, I, I must have been about seven years old. And then I came home and saw, um, and, and, and basically what I'd seen when I was seven years old was a poster of a hockey player. And, and I'm thinking maybe as well, they were playing hockey afterwards after like the session, the afternoon session skate and, um, and went home and just started using a, a, a broom and a tennis ball out the front of the house. <laughs> My dad realized what I was doing. Then when I bought me a little Franklin and hockey set from Toys R Us, but yeah, I mean, ho- hockey wise in terms of people that I played with over the years, I've been very fortunate. Some of my very good mates that I've grown up with playing. Um, some of my best mates have, have gone on to become some of the best players in the country, some of the best players to ever have played for Chelmsford. And, uh, and, and yeah, it's been good fun along the way. So, I mean, you retired just just at the end of the season where COVID finished it, I suppose, wasn't it? That was the last one you, that you played. But then you, you returned earlier this year for the, the Josh Batch testimonial. I did, yeah. How did you so... feel the day after that? Yeah, I, well, do you know it's it's funny because um, I, I'd actually been going out on the ice for for a few months before that because I didn't want to be that guy that goes out, skates, and and falls over and and doesn't do anything. So I'd been going out and and having a a, a, a few uh, sessions with some of the Nighthawks and a few of the other guys, and yeah, it was it was really good fun. It was really good fun. I think for me more than anything else, it was back playing with some of those guys that I mentioned: Danny Hammond, Liam Chong, Sean Barry, um, obviously Josh um and and a few other mates that i've got to know through josh like ben davies and um yeah f- a few others that we've we've got to uh got got to know over the years so yeah it's really good fun and your 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 career now i mean i've i've probably what i've probably said is not wrong but probably not even encompassing half of what you do as a, a business and performance coach you're, you're an author you um and you your your book i can sit there behind you on sale north star thinking so tell us a bit about that and where the ideas for that came from. Yeah, so um, the, the short version is I, I grew up with a belief that money equaled happiness. And I went on a tangent to make as much money as I could as early as I could. Um, and I become pretty good at that. You know, I was the kid at school buying and selling sweets in the playground and ducking and dying, buying stuff out of the paper, selling it on eBay, doing whatever I could to to make a few quid. Um, and then um, I, I, about 18, I stumbled across personal development. At the same time, I went into financial services the more personal development I did, the more money I made. That went on for some years. And then 10 years ago this year, I had a big, what I call lightning moment, life-changing moment, where I realized that my driver was nothing to do with money. It had never really been about money. It was all to do with my dad and how my dad hadn't achieved certain things he was capable of and the impact that had on him and my mum and me and my family and a whole host of other people. And I just vowed in that moment, I don't want anyone else to go through the suffering that he went through and we went through as a result of him not achieving his full potential. So from that moment on, I've just been obsessed with anything to do with human awareness, human potential, human behavior um, to enable people to, to do exactly that. Did you sort of take that belief into playing hockey as well? Did it did it sort of help improve how you were playing? Um, no, is the honest answer. Um, I, I actually think knowing what I know now, there's and it's so easy to say, isn't it, with hindsight, like the amount of things that I would have done differently with in in hockey, even in my my more senior years of of playing hockey, would have just been been so different. The the main thing being is that. Um, What's challenging about hockey, and many people listening to this podcast will know, is that pretty much all the players that were playing at the level that I was playing at with, with the Chieftains and, and, and prior to that, Warriors and whatnot, like nobody makes a full-time living from it, right? So everybody's getting up and going to work the next day. Yeah. But when you're when, – when, for me, I used to wake up at 5 o'clock in the morning, get up, go to work, do a work all day. Then sometimes you wouldn't be getting on the ice till 10.30 at night you become very, very tired. So 
I, I felt that I never really gave my all in training because you never really give your all in training. You're then not as good at games and there's 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 various elements of that. So I think I'd knowing what I know now, I would have applied things very differently. Um but uh, I suppose where a lot of my former teammates would say that my what what I do work wise came in was I, I was very fortunate. I was kind of a captain for I mean I think I was a captain of the Warriors for probably ten years, assistant captain of the Chieftains for I don't know the majority of the years that that I played at Chieftain. So, um, yeah, it's it's probably more that leadership element that uh, that that mapped across as opposed to my own ability as a hockey player. I would say. Yeah, I was going to say that actually. Just I mean, just watching your stuff on social media, where you're obviously you're such a natural talker and and probably naturally like a leader of men. That that was probably a reason behind you being in the leadership team of the hockey teams you were in. Um. I, I I don't know. I I I mean, ultimately, I guess it's coaches that that, that make decisions. But yeah, I um, I mean, I I was very first captain. I think I was under fourteens when I was first ever captain, um, or first ever an actual captain. I think I was first assistant when I was like under ten or whatever. But but first ever captain club when I was under under fourteens, and then that kind of carried on kind of throughout the years. But um, but yeah, I, I think what what a lot of people. And uh, and some people may be aware of, but the thing with hockey, hockey is a, a very very special sport. I mean, lots of sports are great, right? And people build friendships for life through hockey. But hockey for me is more than just a sport. It's it's something that has an ability to be as an individual to build character. You have an ability to um, build discipline. You have an ability to build friendships for life. Um, the, there's there's bonds in hockey that you you kind of that you've really got each other's back. I mean, I played rugby since I was four years old, and, and rugby's similar, but um, but 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 hockey, yeah, it's just a very very special sport. It's something that I still sits very very fondly with me. I mean, you scroll through my Instagram, you know, you're still going to see constant um, updates of 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 things, everything from NHL highlights to UK hockey fights and everything else in between, right? So. But it's 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 a very 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 special sport, and and I think that um, that's one of the the the, the things that um, people that play hockey um, love about it is that it can benefit them in so many different ways. Yeah, I mean you only have to really look at the the tragedy that happened recently and how the the community of players, fans, coaches, everyone involved in the sport all came together as one. Without a doubt, it's it's affected the whole hockey community. Like globally, it's mm. it's uh, yeah, powerful. So you um, obviously you stopped playing twenty twenty. Are, are you done in the sport for good? Is there anything in the future that you think you could get your finger back into it? Um, as a as a player, I've, I've I think this a lot actually, and I think that one of the biggest challenges in ice hockey in the UK is the time of which you train. You know, and it's it, it's it's been difficult at any age, but I think particularly for guys that are in their late twenties, they're in their thirties, going out and training a couple of nights a week till midnight, one o'clock in the morning when you're getting up for work the next day, you've got family commitments, you know, whether it's sort of being there for the kids in the evening, doing bath and bed and things like that. I do think it makes it more challenging. Am, am I in a position where with other priorities I've got in my life right now that I can prioritise giving up sort of those those late nights multiple times a week? The the, the answer is it's it's just not a priority for me right now. But, um, yeah, that, that little taster of being back on the ice a few nights a week uh, back uh, earlier this year before Batch's testimonial, was, it was wicked. You know, it was really, really cool to be back out on the ice. And you, it, it does um, make you realise how much you love it there's a there's an instagram reel that i saw coming up to a year ago and i saw it once and i've never been able to find it again so if anybody listening to this has found this instagram reel please <laughs> message me on any social media email it to me whatever um and it's a, and, it, and it's an instagram reel of of a, of a player doing like a, a sort of point of view as, as he's skating onto the ice and you hear like all this background noise and then you see like one stride out onto the ice and then it's silence and that for me was one of the best ways of describing 
what, what, what playing hockey was like for me. My head runs, uh, my mind runs at 100 miles an hour. I've constantly got things going on in my head. But it's once you take that first skate out onto the ice, that first stride out onto the ice, things just kind of go quiet and, and you can focus and you can be present. And um, that for me is, is, is just incredible. You know, there's there's very, very little that comes close to that feeling. Yeah, that's speaking to some of the younger players that play the game, particularly um, in, in the, the Chieftains as well. There's some young lads. The Slough Jets have got quite a young team. And it's trying to find the the answer for these young guys mentally whether do they get that when they skate on the ice can they block everything out or are they mentally struggling to do what they know they can do but just do it in front of a, a thousand shouting people on a weekend yeah and did you did you ever find that a difficulty playing hockey with your mates maybe some shitty in the street or then you know a thousand people packed in the riverside on the weekend um do you know what it's it's it's, it's really interesting this is where like the work that i do really does come into play so um there's there's something that's known as flow state, um, which is a term, to, um, which, which is a term that was created from a guy sort of decades ago, um, and flow state is that moment that we've all experienced where you are just so present because you are so in the zone and you're so focused. You, you literally, it's like tunnel vision, like everything else just disappears. And flow state has been reported to typically be when you're operating about 4% above your skill level. So not any, much more than you end up breaking down, you can't handle it, much bo more before that you're bored and kind of you're getting distracted or whatever. So when you're in a really competitive game and you're really, it doesn't matter, nobody could be in the rink. Mm. It's really like that. You know, you could be scrimmaging, like having a really good scrimmage on a Tuesday night where there is literally nobody watching or you could be playing a game on a like it could be a playoff final at final leg at Riverside, you know, for the, and there's a thousand people there, like you say, and you can be so in it, you just don't notice anybody there, or at least I I think that's the case when you're really when you're really into it, um, and that's that's definitely a a factor. But what I know I personally did years ago was that I got so caught up in my head, which is then when you which is actually when you play worse so mm -hmm. when you're actually having to think about things and that's the the whole thing is that nobody ever rises to the occasion they always fall to the level of their training so that's why if you train hard and you train like you play you'll find that when those times get difficult you you that that it becomes your baseline if that makes sense yeah rather than thinking oh well it's a great occasion i'm gonna step up to that occasion rarely does that ever happen you tend to fall to the level of your training and um yeah, that's that's kind of my experience. Mm. Can sort of try too hard. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You try too hard and 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 you overthink things and you're you're thinking about too many things going on at once. Whereas if you just kind of be be truly present and you do what your natural ability knows that it can do, that's when you have the best successes. And that's when you see the guys that they just look. It looks effortless for them because in that moment it is completely effortless. They've trained and trained and nobody's got the the God given talent. You know, that they're just naturally amazing at it. Every single player that I know, whether it's the Josh Batches of this world, whether it's the Bartlett's, whether it's um, Liam Chong, Danny Hammond, any, any of the players that I, I think of that I deem to be great players, those guys just trained and trained, whether it's on ice, on ice, off ice, they would just be constantly, constantly, constantly training. And um, and then as a result, they uh, when, when it comes to game time, they're able to perform. Yes, it's, it's truly a mark, isn't it, of a very uh, committed athlete that can train to the level that they can decompartmentalise their thoughts to to perform in the moment, which I'm sure you're having to do in one of your other hobbies because you've recently had your pilot licence, haven't you? Yeah, well, it's not completely done yet, but um, yeah, very nearly done. So uh, yeah, all my theory exams are done now, and and I'm sort of a a few a few uh, a few hours away from from having the full licence, which will be which will be cool. What's the uh, the main goal there to sort of nip yourself off on holiday or just to get around the country a bit quicker? Yeah, actually, you know <laughs> what? So I've been asked this a few times, and and the honest truth is, so this this is a funny story. So I, I said like once upon a time I was I was very obsessed with money, and not just money, but the things that money could buy. So when I was in my sort of early twenties, I'd I'd bought a lot of the things that you might sort of strive to want to have. I had the house, and I had the convertible car, and I had the watches, and whatever. And I remember thinking right now, what else am I going to get? What do I want? And one day I was watching the, the TV and um, there was a micro light 
And I was like, oh, that looks cool. How much is a bike light? So I Googled a bike light. And at the time, I, I can't remember. I think a bike light was like 55 or 15 grand or something. But then a plane was only 30 grand. And I was like, I can get a plane for 30 grand. Like in my head, a plane was going to cost millions of pounds. Yeah. I was like, this is amazing. I'll just, I'll just buy a plane. I thought, no, that's, that's stupid. I, I need to, I need to get a license first. So I started doing a few lessons. And then interestingly, at that time, I remember it was, it was kind of coming into winter, probably this time probably 10 or so years ago actually and um and then obviously where we had hockey at weekends i could only fly like every other weekend and then lessons get cancelled because the weather's not very good so then i ended up just going i'll park this i'll pick it up another time which i then ended up picking up a couple of years ago um and at the time 10 years ago i also thought it'd be a really good thing to do on first dates you know i was single at the time i thought <laughs> right what, what can we do rather than just go for for pizza express i'll say come on let's let's go to france for lunch or whatever i thought that might win me a few brownie points but um but yeah now now it's it's yeah to be able to use for work to commute around a little bit and and I, since i was i don't know three or four years ago i've been obsessed with peter pan you know i've just been obsessed with peter pan the freedom of being able to do whatever you want and uh and, and just I just loved the idea of being able to fly. I used to do a lot of scuba diving years ago. And, and, and that for me was like the nearest feeling to be able to fly. But now, or within, within a couple of months, yeah, to be able to say, right, let's, let's, I don't know, like my friend, Josh, who lives in Wales, who plays for the Cardiff Devils. So, right, come, we'll pop over and go and see him. But rather than a three, three and a half hour drive, it'll be like a 45 minute flight. And, uh, and then couldn't hop back. So yeah, but it's, it's for fun really. You know, I'm not, I'm not planning on, flying people on their holidays in, in an easy jet plane and, and becoming a commercial pilot anytime soon no you won't be having a, an air race with james pentecost anytime soon yeah exactly yeah. i'm not coming yeah. after james's job so yeah. he's, he's, he's all good <laughs> but um did you find moving into to the industry that you've, you've gone into that the the correlations of from being you know for what in this country especially in ice hockey is you know you were near near the top level that you can be in this country did it correlate into to what you do now? So like that ambition. Um, I I think I, look, I've I've always been competitive. You know, I've 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 always I've grown up. I played rugby since I was four years old. Ice hockey since I was eight years old. Um, I've I've done a, a multitude of different sports from boxing to, um, I mean, wh whatever it is. My family are competitive. You know, whether it's playing double or chess or scrabble you know it, we're all out to win so i think there's, yeah. there's something that's kind of in into us um there but uh i i think there's the synergies in in terms of the work that that i do but from from striving i i just think that and this is this is the thing when i reflect back on my hockey career is that i i, I can honestly say day to day i'm constantly striving to be the best that i can be in the work that i do professionally i'm always looking to up my game and if i'm really honest with myself did i think that i did that in in the in the latter years of my hockey career not as much as I would have liked if I'm if I'm being completely honest, you know, because it just wasn't as much of a priority as other things were. Because there's only so many hours in a day, and like I say, when you when you're looking to train at night and late at night, and you're not necessarily giving it your all. Um, so yeah, that's that's what I'd say around that. Yeah, a big part of what you do is um, on social media. Where did did you learn that or pick that up? I'm I'm li literally looking for tips here. Because I, <laughs> I don't really know how the whole thing works. I'm, you know, I'm nearly forty. I didn't grow up with social media, um, and now it's just it's everything. It's a, a, you know, my thirteen-year-old daughter will ask me a question. I'd be like, I don't know. <laughs> um, so social media is really interesting. One, I, I think that there is, um, it, it, it comes back down to, and I, I look at things as a business. So whether it's a podcast whether it's a um uh whether, whether it's a business whatever you you've got to begin with the end in mind like what are we trying to do here and i think in 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 whether it's social media or a podcast you you make a decision are we looking to educate or entertain because if you can compartmentalize into two different parts then or, or two different types then that that all of a sudden helps you get clearer on the direction of where you want things to go so for example some people social media is solely set up they want to entertain people they want to make people laugh in whatever that might look like whether it's meme accounts or whatever else some people they just really want to educate people so they want to provide scores and updates and show highlights of reels of of, of things that have gone on so it's it's getting clear like what what are we trying to do here and um 
and and then always remembering people engage with things that they want and if you've got something that you think is going to be useful when it's going to be insightful for people when you're sharing that then get clear on what is it that people want so i don't think that that you're ever going to do yourself uh, an injustice by finding out the people that you want to be consuming your social media the people that you want to be listening to your podcast what do they want what else do they like what else do they listen to what else do they follow on social media and i'm constantly looking to i call it borrowing ideas you know i'm constantly borrowing ideas from other people whether it's the the guests that they have whether it's the type of content that they do and um and, and then you can you can create that um you can get that mix and and you're one of the best people to, to to see that you know if you're scrolling through social media and you start noticing what is it that i find myself watching what whose post do I almost always stop and read and watch? Why is that? Why why did I skip so and so's post, but I did always read these ones? What is it that they've done? And um, sometimes it could be really tactical stuff, like if it's a written post, it might be the hook that they start with. You know, is it a hook that catches somebody attention? Is it because you know that you're going to typically learn something? Is it because the image is really entertaining? If it's a video, um, what is it that they do? And there's there's loads of ways of breaking things down. Um, like, I don't know, if you had a guest on and you asked them um, what's the, the 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 five things that they think that make a great hockey player, well, if you put that clip out on social media, is the five people, the, the, the five things that X person thinks make hockey players great, all of a sudden that person already knows up front there's five things they're more likely to watch to the end of the video. Yeah. What that then starts doing is it triggers the algorithm to show more of that content because the fact they've watched that whole video would imply to the algorithm they liked it and would want to see more of it and so on and so forth. So there's a bit of a game that has to be played. But yeah, um, yeah that, that's kind of a, a suggestion. It's a very new world, isn't it, that we've all kind of had to learn very quickly because it's kind of massively taken over. Um, yeah. And I did see for this year, you set yourself a challenge. I think, was it 24 podcasts you wanted to go on? Or was it 23? No, 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 no. So, yeah, no, so it's a great point. So when my book came out in um, uh, July, it came out, um, I, I worked out that I think there was, there was at the time, there was 24 weeks left of the year. So I said, I'm just going to average... Um, I'm going to try and average one one interview a week before the year's out in relation to kind of what what we're doing in there, um, which I think we're, we're, we're pretty much, well, we're either on track with where everything is booked in or, um, yeah, we, we're going to achieve. So, uh, yeah, that's that, that's been good. But, yeah, I'm, I'm constantly setting those those goals, whatever they might be, personally, professionally, financially, to, to try and improve and, and be better and, uh, yeah, have a bit of fun along the way as well. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's certainly a great sort of addition to it, isn't it? If you can set those personal goals. I mean, would you say, like, it's a, a small goals thing? Set small goals, achievable, achieve them, then get bigger? Um, It's it's, it's a really, it's, it, I'm, I'm dancing around this because it, it depends on the school of thought. So yeah. one of my concepts, and it's literally what I've written the book on, it's called North Star Thinking, is about having a goal in life that's so big you never achieve, right? And a lot of people go, well, why the hell would I ever do that? Because then I'm never going to be happy if I don't ever achieve that thing. And that that's the point I'm trying to get people to do is detach from the outcome and focus on the process. If you're getting your fulfillment every day from focusing on the process, then you're not constantly thinking that you're going to be happy when you get to the outcome. I call it when then syndrome. You know, people set lots of short term goals and they go, right, well, I'll, ha I'll be happy when I've got this. I'll be happy when I've got that. I'll be happy when this is done. You know, and they, they just find themselves constantly pinballing around and they're never actually happy. You know, even if they achieve the very thing that they want, they're happy for a few minutes. The next thing you know, they are chasing the next goal. And it's, it's just this, it's, it's like, you know, you, you you see the donkey with the carrot and like they never actually get to the carrot. It's a bit like that. And is that what you learned when you were younger from wanting to just make lots of money that you it was then, oh, the next big thing, the next big thing? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The, the, like now what, now what, now what? So that, that, so that's the kind of the overarching philosophy. However, people are driven in different ways. You know, like I personally would rather shoot for the stars and hit the moon because I believe if you shoot for the moon, you hit the lamppost. So basically what I'm saying is I will aim big and I'll be happy if I don't kind of hit the, the overall outcome that I'm looking for. Whereas other people that really, um, 
that that really demoralizes them because they what they build their confidence their momentum from hitting lots of goals so they in that case they're better to start small and then build up over time because that's going to be better for them so it's understanding what what works best for you and um and and then being able to build on from that but if you're looking at creating habits and things like that then it's always better to start small and then build those up um would be my thought on that yeah that's, that's, that's why i asked because i sort of I did a little bit of research into north star thinking and and what the sort of the goal of it was and it and it actually really spoke to me actually because i'd never really heard it put like that it's you know it's something i've i've worked for myself in the past my wife has as well and yeah to sort of set that massive goal but just enjoy the journey rather than the outcome was a it's an incredibly powerful statement well that's exactly it you know it's so cliche enjoy the journey but the reality is a lot of people don't and it doesn't mean that everything's got to be simple and easy you know i I believe that optimal growth comes at the border of support and challenge so you want to have the challenge and you want things to test you um because that's when you're going to you're, you're going to grow the most and i think deep down any goal that anybody ever sets isn't really about the goal it's who you become whilst you're striving towards achieving the the, the, the goal yeah yeah you, know, you, you look at a hockey you look at a hockey team they want to win the playoffs or whatever the the character and the commitment and the team camaraderie that has to be created you know one of the things that i've noticed over the years is the teams that i that, that have always performed the best they've just got something special about them, like the dressing room, not just like the, the whole team gelling. And I don't just mean on the ice as a line and making sure that passes are flowing and breakouts are working well. I mean, the banter in the dressing room, like the, when you when you have this disconnect and you create different little groups in the within the team and that, that that's when you, you, you kind of know that you're not onto something good. But when everybody's got everybody's back and, and, and it's a healthy element of um of, of banter. That's when I think it you, you generally see the teams that, that go on and do really well. Did did you miss that when you left the sport, the room? Yeah, hundred percent. Hundred percent. But but what was interesting for me was that the, there's like a core that I grew up playing with. And obviously as people get older and things change, people have kids and new coaches come in and start changing dynamics, you you, you do find yourself um yeah, that, that just changes, you know, because there's people you've had relationships for years, grown up playing with for 10, 20 years, and then all of a sudden they stop playing or they go to another team or the coach drops them because they bring in a bunch of new guys. And and and, and certainly for me, it got to the point where I realised that actually, and I think a lot of hockey players will, will vouch for this, is that they realised that actually they wasn't going hockey for hockey. They were going hockey for their mates and the hockey become like the addition if that makes sense um it, it was kind of the bonus and then when your mates aren't there and you're playing hockey then it oh at least that's what it was like for me and i know a bunch of others that, that have kind of felt the same over the years i think a lot of professional sportsmen say when they leave there especially team sports that they don't miss the sport when they've given up it's it's the room that they miss and the banter and the, the camaraderie did you try and replace it somehow um then I try and replace it. I mean, I, I think that I'm quite fortunate in the work that I do. I've got a very social, um, like every, like pretty much every hour, every day, I'm speaking to somebody and there's groups and, and WhatsApp groups and various different things. Um, so I, I think that it was kind of already replaced by default. So it didn't, I didn't have like this period of time where I was like, I'm really missing something. That said, that said, I'm, I'm going to, contradict myself here a little bit i'm I'm at the moment i'm in a position where i'm missing sport so mm. I, I i was playing a little bit of rugby i've done my ankle in and, and and i haven't done anything but i'm i'm going to the gym i'm exercising i go there i have my headphones in but i am missing a bit of team sport at the moment so just having that um hobby whatever you want to call it outside of work um so yeah i'm so i appreciate i'm actually contradicting myself so there is that there is there's that and then even now you know i've got i've done a little bit of boxing got back into a little bit of boxing but um would like to get back to a bit of rugby um once my ankle's fixed but um there's that that's a huge part i think that that sport plays for people is it gives them that social life and that that interaction and i think the other thing that's interesting is that when you're playing sport in most cases, it just it's a leveler. 
You know, it doesn't matter whether you're old, you're young, whether you're experienced, inexperienced, whether you um, are, are a student or whether you've got a really good professional career in banking or whatever it might be. When you're in that, everyone's on the same level. Yeah. And I think that's that's cool. I remember having a conversation with James Aylin, actually, not that long ago. Well, a few years ago, and we were both saying that that like he he's really re- well respected in his career. Um, cause have you had James Aylin on the podcast? I have, yeah. Yeah, so obviously James has, has, has been incredibly successful in, in the world of production and obviously a lot of people want him because he can provide them work and acting work and all that stuff. So he's a lot of people that won't say certain things to him, but it, what he always said was in the dressing room, you can rely on somebody that's going to that's gonna banter you and that's going to dress you down a little bit when you've had everybody else sucking up to you all day <laughs> and, and, then, and then you walk in of an evening and, and somebody rips you straight away as soon as you walk in for whatever it is that you've done. And um, and, and I think that that's, yeah, that, that's a part that's, that's definitely missed for sure. Yeah, J- uh, James and Frankie Sabini were supposed to come on together last season right. but they ended up coming on separately because they worked on a project called the enforcer which they, they did indeed they filmed yeah. at the riverside we're st- i think we're still yet to see the short the short version of it hopefully it's um it gets enough traction they can make a full-length version yeah so yeah now that was really interesting to speak to them but will thank you so much for your time man i've really enjoyed uh talking to you especially all about the what you do with your job because it's the positivity is just infectious and i just i love to hear it that's why i love sticking on all your social media videos Thank you. No, I appreciate it. And am, am I right, Sam? Was it you that I saw up a mountain wearing a chieftain shirt? Was that you? No, that wasn't me. Ah, uh, right. Okay. No, uh, my daughter was up the top of the Burj Khalifa <laughs> in a uh, right. chieftain shirt. No, there, there was somebody last season that I saw that had a bit, and I couldn't really see because it was it was. Um, it oh, was... you bumped into a skiing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that, yeah. I think I think I think that's Andy. I think I think Andy. Ah, uh, right. Okay. Yeah. Him, yeah him I, remember, I remember they had a beard, but um, but yeah. Other than that. That's... Yeah. No, you would not catch me skiing. No way. Right, fair enough. Fair no, enough. I'm I'm a hot holiday person. <laughs> fair enough. Well, Ben, thanks so much for having me, and uh, really good to chat. Yeah, no, it's been a real pleasure, mate. Real pleasure, and uh, all the best for for North Star thinking and completing your podcast challenge for the rest of this year. Thank you very much. Lovely. Cheers. A massive thank you to Will for joining me on ZPG. was supposed to be a few weeks ago, but after my dog ended up in the vets, we had to move it. So I'm, but I'm so glad that we've got it done. Fixtures for next week then. Invicta Dynamos have a huge weekend to recover from two blanks as they face a two-game series with rock bottom Milton Keynes Thunder, starting in Gillingham on Saturday at 5.45 and a 6.45 face-off in MK on the Sunday. On the Saturday, Slough Jets host the Solent Devils at the Hangar for 6.30pm and the Streatham Red Hawks are visited by the Romford Buccaneers. On the Sunday, just the one other game to add to the Thunder vs Dynamo's matchup is the reinvigorated Oxford City Stars will look to come and take points off the Chelmsford Chieftains at the Riverside at 6pm. Once again, thank you so much for listening. Thank you to Will Polston for giving up his time for us, the coaches for supplying their coaches' thoughts, and also thank you to the Streatham Red Hawks who took very good care of me on Saturday night. Episode 56 is in the bank. Next week, we've got another big episode as we discuss concussion protocols with brain injury thriver and survivor David Jacko Jackson and former player Danny Wright. So thank you once again. Check out all the socials on Instagram, Facebook, X, Threads, TikTok, Snapchat, YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts. Congratulations to Mama B's Soaps who won the Zero Pucks Given Bubble Hat. Loads of new colours available at the ZPG merch store. You can find that in the link tree on the social profiles. So once again, thank you for listening and I will see you next week.